More than 150 years after America banned slavery, we still battle with its legacy. The conversation over race extends to every level of society and includes some of the nation's most prominent institutions. Michelle Miller went to Louisiana in search of the troubling history of Washington, D.C.'s Georgetown University. Michelle, good morning. Good morning. 178 years ago, Georgetown was free to everyone who was able to attend. It was also massively in debt. To pay that debt, the university sold 272 slaves, the very people that helped to build the school itself. Today, its leaders, students, and alumni are grappling with how to confront that very history. You have not attempted to open it? No, not in a number of years. Cherylyn Branch and her older brother John have lost their family history twice. Once when Hurricane Katrina washed away names and dates in the family Bible. What information is in here? We record marriages. So every be. important date in a family. Right. Yeah. And once, generations ago, to the whitewashing of history. So the third row, that's what I'm thinking, but I'm, I don't know. A history that for many African Americans can only be traced back a few generations. The branches relied on tales told by elders, like this one, of great ants traded as the currency of nation building. It seems as though I am told that very young, she waved goodbye to her mother on a shore and watched her mother get on a, a ship or a boat. And so she never saw her again. And so how did that happen? When did that happen? Where did she go? These missing pieces. They are definitely missing pieces. Until a phone call from a stranger started to fill in the holes of her family tree. So what did you say to Sherilyn? I listed the names of You said hi. Hi, this is, this is Richard Cellini. I'm an alumnus of Georgetown. Were you suspect at first? I was not suspect because I didn't give him information. He gave me information. He came up with names that I knew from my grandmother's side of the family. And like that, she said, let's start the whole conversation over again. Richard Cellini told Branch that her great-great-grandparents, Hillary and Henny, were part of a group of 272 slaves who in 1838 were sold by Georgetown University to three plantations in southern Louisiana, near where Branch and her brother still live. Was this the piece of the puzzle you just didn't have? Well, certainly my entire identity is wrapped up in the folks who came before me, the things that uh, made us family, the traditions that were handed down. This church in particular ministered to their needs. Cellini isn't a historian. He runs a software company. But last November, after researching his alma mater, he happened upon Georgetown's slave sale, which settled a debt and saved the university. They were sold for $115,000 in 1838 money, which would be about $3.3 million today. And that money was literally used to help Georgetown avoid bankruptcy. Well, hello. <laughs> Cellini hired Baton Rouge genealogist Judy Riffle to help him track down the descendants of those original 272 slaves. She poured through meticulous records kept by Louisiana clergymen, priests who baptized, married, and even buried slaves who stayed true to the faith. Year 1847, yeah. baptized Bazile, yeah. son of Henny. Right. Wow, that's amazing. Lineages in black and white. Cellini yeah, estimates there are between 10 and 15,000 descendants living mean? today. There's only one thing that separates these benefactors from most of Georgetown's other benefactors. And what is that? It's race. I can see that if somebody had written a check in 1838 that wiped out the university's debts, there is no doubt in my mind that buildings would be named after that person, that person would be celebrated, and his descendants would have no problem whatsoever being admitted to Georgetown, even down unto this day. We're saying, what is our responsibility today, in this moment? John DeJoya is Georgetown University's president. Slavery, part of why yeah. it was so awful was that for 200 years, people could not pass on right. any form of wealth to the next generation. And here is an institution on the backs of 272 people, certainly 
the debt was paid. Could the university offer, you know, legacy status? Sure. These, it's a tough question. The, the, it, these are complicated for a number of reasons. Why? I believe the fundamental question that we're wrestling with now is how can we contribute in new ways to ensuring ever more access and affordability to higher education in America for the hundreds of thousands who are not able to access it. DeJoya convened a group of students, alumni, and professors, which will make several recommendations on how the university should best recognize its role in slavery. He's even met with some of the descendants themselves, asking the question they've faced for generations, how to pay back that human investment. Do you feel as though Georgetown owes these families a debt? Well, certainly. Um, how to collect on a debt from however long ago um, is, wouldn't be my purpose. But if Georgetown wants to do something, it may be the benefit for my nieces and nephews um, and great nieces and nephews yes. would be wonderful. Um, it would be fantastic. The university is hoping that by the fall they will have concrete ideas about how to memorialize the 272 original slaves. Some early ideas include memorials, campus dialogues, and scholarships, but most importantly, this story is part of a larger conversation about equality, and they really hope it will continue. Mm -hmm. I read in the, the, the paper that the historians say this is the first time that a president of an elite university has met with the descendants of slaves in this type of case, yeah. It is the first time, and Jack DeJoya, John DeJoya, is adamant about making sure these conversations are one heard and that they have a process beyond this. Two Georgetown graduates sitting right here. That's yeah. a great story. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you.